So, Diana, I was wondering if we could start by um, looking at the role of the director. What is a director? Are you able to summarise the job in a sentence? If I was going to summarise it in a sentence, it would be a very, very long sentence. I'm not sure it's possible. But I think that the conversation has been, you know, really positive over the last little while because people have moved away from the statement that, oh, well, the directors are the representatives of the shareholders. Because, of course, a director's role is to ensure that the company, which has its own personality in a legal sense, is steward, act in the best interests of that company. And so when you think about that, it enables you to broaden out to the role of addressing what's the framework that you need in the company to ensure that all of the right decisions are made around addressing opportunities, addressing risks, and thinking about that for the longer term. So that would be one extremely long compound sentence. But I think I've trapped the main idea there. Fantastic. Uh, as an MBA graduate and an economics bachelor, did you always have your sights set on the board? What, uh, what was your pathway? What inspired you to become a director? It's interesting because I really wouldn't have said, until really I came back to Australia, you know, just a bit over a decade ago, that this was a pathway I really wanted to follow. But I did have some quite interesting experiences along the way that made me understand the importance of the role. Um, first, my parents were very active in community organisations and they encouraged me to do the same. So I had some really early experiences around sport where mum and dad encouraged me to serve on committees um, and I was the player representative on the tribunal at the WA Basketball Association at one point. And um, so that sort of gave me a sense that there was this thing that went on where there were committees and people that sort of sat above and did something different. But the most important experience for me was when I joined Westpac in the early 90s. And Westpac was going through a very difficult time because the commercial property bubble had burst and Westpac had been overexposed and didn't have a good global exposure management system to be able to understand their true exposure. As a result, um, the board changed radically. Five directors fell on their sword. The chairman went. Um, a new chairman came in and the chief executive left as well. And that chairman had to step in as an executive chair and start to structure the organisation in a way that enabled it to step through all of this turmoil, all of the activism of the shareholders who were incredibly disappointed at the shock that they had had and find a chief executive at the same time who was going to be able to lead into really the next century. Mm. Um, I was working as the chief of staff to the chief executive not long before he left that role. So I was in a position to be able to see this happen. I moved out of there into a business role, but was a shareholder, very closely interested in what was going on in that part of the organisation. And it was the behaviour of that chairman, John Urey, mm -hmm. that made me see the importance of the role, how critical it was, that it really was very, very central. And I remember years later um, seeing him at a function at, at Westpac and I said, oh, Chairman, it's so lovely to see you. And he said, Diane, it really is time you started calling me John. And I said, Chairman, there's no way I can do that. To me, you are Chairman. It's just something about the way you carried yourself. I can never, ever call you anything but that. So when I became a chair in my own right, I was like, well, people say, oh, you can be a chairwoman. I thought, well, no, you know, chairman is the thing. So I actually don't mind being called chairman because to me it's what John Urey did to ensure the survival of Westpac, the company. He took that director role and, boy, he aced it. Wonderful. Uh, you've such a wealth of board experience. Um, is there a particular achievement or contribution that you're significantly proud of? 
I don't know that pride is the sort of emotion. Um, when you're driven to be a director and you want to continue to have impact and a contribution, um, it's where did you make that contribution? Um, so on the wall behind me um, are things that I've collected along the way that reflect some of those moments of contribution. Um, and the one that's just over that shoulder, get the shoulder right, the one that's just over that shoulder um, is from the time I was at Transfield and then Broad Spectrum and I was chairman of that company for a three year period. One of the things that Broad Spectrum did was to provide contract services to the federal government um, and the governments in Nauru and New Guinea with the asylum seekers in the regional processing centres. Mm. And that was a very difficult contract for a number of reasons. It was a very large contract and it was financially quite important to the company. But Broad Spectrum had been working for government for a very long time, providing outsourced um, services and often in um, remote, difficult places uh, with fly-in, fly-out workforce and often with localised workforce where there was a skills transfer and development um, element to what you were doing. Um, we also did very difficult technical work like maintenance on offshore platforms for organisations like Woodside and so forth. Um, so when... Um, the regional processing centres needed to be stood up very quickly. People in government knew that Broad Spectrum was a company that could do this. They had real deep exposure to the company before. And so it was a piece of work that we were well qualified to do. And the board took a risk approach to it. It was necessary for the board to sign off operating in those jurisdictions because we didn't operate there. And that was a power reserved to the board. So we made the decision um, and then off we went. And when we um, started to come to activist attention and particularly divestment campaigns from some of the industry super funds, media were saying to the company, well, you know, did you assess the risk? Yes, of course, but that was like two years ago. Um, that's how the process works. And it was interesting to see the lack of understanding um, in mainstream media, um, business media, and particularly with the activists, about the role that the board would take to give management permission or otherwise to do this sort of work. So what happened was we were accused of abusing human rights. Now, our task was initially to facilities manage to make sure people had a good, safe place to stay, that they were fed. Um, and then eventually we did move into more welfare work where we were responsible for providing them with a constructive day. Um, and to be told that you're abusing human rights, of course, the first thing you just go, well, of course we're not. You know, we've got all of these routines and code of conduct and, and we're, you know, a good principal company. We do the right thing. The thing where I could say I have a bit of pride about is the board as a collective said, let's take a step back. Let's just really make sure that we're standing on the strongest foundation. And so we said, well, what is it that makes us so confident that we're not abusing human rights? So we looked to our code of conduct and we looked to the training that we gave people and we looked to the measurements and the hindsighting and we said, let's take this framework and let's validate it, verify it, almost as if we're about to put it in a prospectus. Let's do that with a legal standard. So off we went. Well, of course, when you look, you find. So 90% was fantastic. Every now and then we go, but if we're really saying this in the code of conduct, but we're not checking it over here and it's not as resident, that, okay, we better fix that. And we went on an 18 month journey where we just improved our ability to provide service in those contracts. And we improved our ability to say that we were not abusing human rights. I'm very confident that the company never abused anybody's human rights and where there were things that occurred that weren't, within our code of conduct and the behavioural standards we'd set for our staff, we found them and appropriate consequence management occurred. Because when you've got thousands of people flying and flying out, if you don't find some things that you think don't fit your frame, you're probably not looking hard enough. 
So, you know, looking back on that, that's a, a thing I think we did extremely well. And as leader of the board, um, I was really proud of the way that we behaved to allow our people to provide good service. And I said in the media at that time, you know, I am actually proud of the employees of Broad Spectrum on Madison Nauru. And of course, that caused an incredible media storm. Um, you know, and people may say, oh, how can you possibly be proud of a setting where people were in the centres for three years, four years, five years? Well, of course, as an Australian, I'm not proud of that. Um, I think the system that was designed to take the boats away, the unsafe activity that was going on there, the organised crime, people smugglers and so forth, absolutely need to be addressed. Where did it fall down? Well, it was supposed to be people would come, they would be looked after, processed and then resettled. And that last bit didn't happen. And I think that's the piece that is very disappointing for everyone that was involved in that system. But it doesn't mean that the impact that Broad Spectrum had in looking after people is any the less. Yes, and I, I, I would think that any board could learn huge lessons, um, those lessons of, around being open and reflective and being open to continual improvement. You're right, no, no system is perfect, no board is perfect. Uh, it's those that stick their head in the sand, let their ego do the talking and defend their position without being really reflective. I think that's where the danger sets in. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you've had uh, presumably some key mentors or people who have de deeply influenced your career, your journey. I was wondering if you might share uh, perhaps a few of your, your, if not mentor stories, then you know, perhaps some just general stories around how you've been mentored. Yeah, mentoring is such an important thing um, because mentoring for me is being able to identify people who have trod a path that you're about to. They've already gone along there. They've made a few mistakes along the way. And if they're prepared to help you understand that dynamic, it extends your situational reach. It makes you wise before you get there. Uh, and so I have been really fortunate to have some fantastic mentors um, and first among equals is Helen Lynch. Helen um, is an amazing woman who was the first female to manage a branch of any bank in Australia. Um, and as someone who had started as a teller in rural Queensland, uh, that uh, was a, a great achievement in and of itself. But then when she ended up in the C-suite at Westpac and uh, chaired OPSM, was on the Coles Meyer board, on the uh, Westpac board itself, that was a, an amazing achievement. So Helen had so much to um, teach me and she was always very generous with her advice and seemed to have a sixth sense about when to pick up the phone to call me. Now, of course, it's supposed to be the mentee's responsibility to identify when you need that support um, and to pick up the phone and, and make those calls. Um, and I think there is, these mentoring moments come up all the time. Um, when I was at Broad Spectrum, um, I had to chair the annual general meeting when the activism was at its absolute peak. Uh, and as luck would have it, a week or so before that, I was doing um, an event with Katie Lay, who was at Corn Ferry at the time, and she had asked Michael Cheney to make some comments about being a chair. And we were sitting at Fraser's restaurant in Kings Park and Michael said to me, how's Broad Spectrum going? That's not the easiest chair gig. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to be chairing the annual general meeting next week. And I, you know, I'm sure I'm going to have some activists there. And as it turned out, um, we had some activists that came in as proxy holders and disrupted the meeting. And I had to eject these people. And I was given great positive feedback on how well I had done it and how calm I had been. And of course, when I said to Michael, oh, I've got this thing happening, he then went into mentoring mode and described to me two or three instances where he'd had really difficult moments in AGMs and how he thought it through and what I might want to think about. So, you know, you can be so fortunate to get the mentoring in the moment 
um, from someone like that. Um, I've been mentored by Dean Pritchard, who is a very experienced non-executive director uh, who was on the Broad Spectrum board with me. So it's not as chairman that you can't have um, mentoring coming from your colleagues. Uh, Dean had deep experience in um, health and safety. He'd worked in the construction industry for, you know, uh, a great deal of his career. And he'd worked with um, European companies that have some, you know, different ways of addressing some of these things. And so it was very interesting to have his input around that. And he taught me a huge amount. So I think mentoring is always there and you've got to be open to that self-development and that growth. Um, you know, I learned a fantastic lesson um, from Siobhan McKenna who was on the NBN Co Foundation board with me around always having a perspective, always having an answer. And I think when you get those early lessons from people, they do live with you for, for a very long time and you see those things are the directors. So I had a director on one of my boards who couldn't come to an answer, who was always well on the one hand, but on the other hand, I can't quite make up my mind. I remember having to sit down with them and saying, you must have a very sore derriere because you are sitting on the fence. And then I described what Siobhan had said to me about always needing an answer and about, you know, judgment being about making a decision without full information. And that's so important for a director. And that if you can't come to an answer, you then need to work out how you can. And then having a long conversation with that person about how they could come to an answer and putting in place some support. So um, you do need to roll those mentor lessons forward. Great advice once again. Um, so I, of course, just interested in, in what motivates you? What, uh, what makes you most excited or passionate about being a director? What gets you up in the morning to do the things that you do? Well, you know, we're all child, you know, of our parents and of our history. And I do think it's very important to know yourself to be very self-aware. Um, connection, connection, connection is something Genevieve Hawkins has written in her book about how important it is to offer your colleagues the gift of knowing you a little bit so that they can connect with you better and provide you with better support. Um, and so I do think it's really important to understand what it is that motivates you and also to understand what stresses you and what builds your resilience. So my parents were doers. They were people who, if they saw a gap, they got on. You know, they built the house that um, I lived in with their own hands because they couldn't afford the bank loan until it got to Plateite. So they had to get it there. There was no kindergarten in the community. They fundraised, they lobbied, they built again. You know, whenever there was a gap, my mum and dad would sort of step into it. So they were great people of action and they had a lot of impact. They made a lot of contribution. So I've always wanted to emulate that. For me, one of the big drivers has also been equity. If it's unjust, I'm very uncomfortable. And I think that's why I've become such an advocate for gender equity mm. and for inclusiveness mm. and for economic development for all. Um, to think more broadly about the social agenda that we can have. And, and in the work that I'm doing at CEDA, that's a real guiding light for me and why I'm so aligned with that organisation, which, of course, the pair of us share uh, as a common passion. So I know these are the things that, that drive me. Uh, and so it's organisations that can bring this type of flavour. You know, I've worked in large organisations, consulted to large organisations all through my career. So I feel that's a space I know well. So being part of West Farmers for such a long time has been a real joy to me because it is an organisation with weight and muscle. Mm -hmm. And by being a director of that, you can help shape the contribution that it makes. And that's why something like AGL Energy was a very attractive directorship to me because it's working very hard on carbon transition and it's not in an easy space. I sometimes think if it's an easy directorship, no one's going to pick up the phone and call me because I do like the challenge. Um, and I've been fortunate to have spent time at places like McKinsey and Company, West Farmers, Westpac, where you do learn these industrial strength analytic skills and, and you learn to have high aspiration. Um, and so it, I guess it's impact and contribution and it sounds very trite, but that is what gets me up and gets me moving. 
Wonderful. Now, of course, you sit on um, a broad range of organisations from the listed space. You've mentioned West Farmers and AGL, but also community associations like CEDA, which we both share, and Chief Executive Women, which is a, a passion. Do you take a different approach to the, the different boards, whether it's a, a publicly listed company, a private company, a not-for-profit? Do your director duties differ? Uh, what should people be mindful of when they're sitting on boards of organisations in different sectors? Look, I think all the lawyers are sitting up and going, of course the duties don't differ. And of course they don't. You have the same core responsibility to the company. But it is going to be different because you will find that there are different resources available in organisations. And it is a tricky one because I think um, directors that are on large organisations do want to make a contribution in the not-for-profit space. Uh, but you also don't want to turn up and sort of be seen to be taking over and trying to make organisations run before they can walk. Um, so it is a, it's a bit of an art in working out what's the right pace of evolution of governance, because I think every organisation should be evolving its governance all the time. If you're not improving and constantly checking it and going through that cycle of reviewing charters, you haven't got them writing them, you know, all those sorts of things, uh, you're really not doing your job. So what I've tried to do is to create, curate a set of directorships that has a lot of diversity in it. So as well as the listed companies, there are the privately held ones, the member-based organisations. So I've been on the board of co-ops in the past. I've done some really small private equity things. I've been associated with some floats, you know, micro cap type things. And it all builds different muscles for you. And it sees different ways that you can get the same outcomes of doing the, um, your discharging your director's duties, but in different settings. Mm -hmm. So the duties always remain the same, clearly the way you're going to discharge in this different, but the, the thing is always do it with intent, do it explicitly, talk about it, don't ever assume. Um, it's when you make assumptions that you really come a cropper. Yeah, indeed. So um, certainly, I think one of the uh, really key things that many of our audience, audience who are, you know, obviously aspiring to be one day where you are, um, what are some of the skills that you think are absolutely critical? And maybe separate that out if need be. What are some of the skills that you really need to hone in, for example, the listed space versus the NFP space? I think the skills um, that you bring to a board can be thought about in a couple of ways. You know, there's obviously some foundational skills. You really do need to be able to understand governance and you need to be able to read a profit and loss or statement of comprehensive income and a balance sheet. Or a we, all still, we all still call them the, the, the P&L. and well, the P and L and a balance sheet. But you <laughs> need to have, you know, enough um, comfort with that. Um, to be able to steward the financial affairs of the organisation that you're dealing with. But I think every director needs to have an ability to be forensic. Mm -hmm. If you're not curious and you don't find it interesting to ask questions and look into the reasons behind things in a forensic way, you're going to find it pretty hard to be a director. Um, I think you also need to be able to frame questions really well, but it's not just about asking questions elegantly, it's the intent behind that. And that's, I think, where some of the analytic comes in. So you need to be able to understand um, what it is the company is doing, the business models, you know, how it's operating and have a perspective. Having a perspective, the thing that Siobhan McKenna was always banging on about, um, which is a bit of a McKinsey thing as well, and she and I both, both shared McKinsey in our past, um, is super important for a director. And you do need to have the ability to be collegial. One of the other things that I think is a thing you need to think about in terms of are my skills relevant for this particular opportunity is what diversity do you actually bring to the board? Because a couple of times I've had... Um, you know, a search consultant will call me and say, oh, there's a seat coming up on such and such a board, you'd be perfect. And I think, I think I could make a contribution there and it's something I could be interested in. But I look around the table and I say, but didn't you just put so-and-so on that board two years ago? So they've got a lot of runway there. 
and they're very similar to me. You know, maybe I had a consulting background, um, or maybe they're somebody, you know, who had the sort of international exposures I've had, or maybe they're a person who's, you know, in that op risk type framework that I come from. I said, well, what am I going to add to this board? Oh, you'd be great. That's not the question. It's what am I going to add to this board? So skills and merit are always contextual, but never more so when you're thinking about a board. Uh, and so I say to people when they ask me, how do I get that elusive first board? Or how do I, you know, look at expanding my portfolio? And I say, well, let me have a look at your CV. And they give me a beautiful summary in reverse chronological order of their career. And it's lovely. And I say, yeah, but this doesn't tell me why you'd be a great director for company X that you're aspiring to join. Where's the synthesis of all of the things that you've done, your skills and experience, that tells me as the chairman what it is you would bring and what would make you different to the great raft of directors I've already got. Because you know yourself better than anybody else. You know the things you've done, the skills that you've built, the experiences you've had better than anybody else. So you are best equipped to synthesise that experience. So how do you synthesise it in a meaningful way? We've got to understand the company. You know, you do have to do the work. You've got to read the last three annual reports. You've got to go on the websites and listen to the last couple of analysts' briefings. You've got to go through the website, understand the strategy, understand the risks. You know, if that floated not so long ago, you beauty, there's a prospectus. Read that thing, understand it, and then match what you see from there to what you've got to offer. The beauty of that is, well, it's risky. You better get this right. But the beauty of it is that's your due diligence at the same time. Exactly. And, and CV curation for jobs is something that everyone needs to do for every job, uh, directors included. Yeah, that's right. Because when you um, start to write your CV in that way and think about the companies that you could make a contribution to, it drives you very much towards education that you might need in the future and it drives you towards who to network with. Because yeah. networking is only useful if you're networking with the right people. Indeed. Great advice once again. So, look, finally, um, what would you say is the biggest challenge that you've had in your career? The biggest challenge I've had in my career is being a woman. I think it's really simple. Um, it has been really interesting since I started working in the early 1980s um, because you were expected to have certain sort of aspirations. You're expected to behave in a certain sort of way. And I've never fit that comfortably into that expectation. So it has been difficult for me at times um, to overcome the challenge of being a woman trying to make a lot of impact and contribution um, and trying to do it in, you know, an inclusive sort of way. And there have been times in my career where I haven't been particularly nuanced. I've allowed that um, impatience to come through or I've been too direct. Uh, but um, it has been very difficult um, trying to find a pathway. And, of course, another beaut thing is I hear I'm Western Australia and I'm not a resources person um, by training. You know, I did an economics degree and then I went into banking and, and in operational banking, running branches, running call centres, this type of thing. And so that wasn't going to happen in Western Australia. Um, I have um, over the last decade, and of course in my time at McKinsey, deepened my exposure to resources, but sort of being in a resources hub without getting into that industry. And I look back on it and think, should I have been a mining engineer? No, no, I think, I think I've ended up in the right place. I think so. Well, look, it's been fantastic to chat with you. Obviously, you've made such a huge contribution across corporate Australia and the not-for-profit sector. And in particular, um, I, I would say a trailblazer for women, you know, paving the way to make our journey easier than perhaps yours has been and, and to aspiring directors as well. So thank you so much for your time today. Well, very much my pleasure.